A Kayak, A Tale from the Iditarod by Robert J. Blake. Here is a map of the Iditarod race. It goes from Anchorage to Nome. Day one, a kayak knew it. The other dogs knew it too. Some had run it many times and others had never run it at all. But not a dog wanted to be left behind. A kayak. It was Iditarod race day, 1,151 miles of wind, snow, and rugged trail lay ahead from Anchorage to Nome. A kayak had led the team through seven races and knew the trail better than any dog. She had brought them in fifth, third, and second, but had never won. She was 10 years old now. This was her last chance. Now, they must win now. Crack, the race was underway. One by one, 58 teams took off for Nome. Day two, come on, old girl, show them how, Mick called. Ha, Mick worked the 16 dog sled team through a kayak, calling ha when she needed the dogs to turn left and gee to go right. Mick was the musher, but the team followed the lead dog. The team followed a kayak. Through steep climbs and dangerous descents, icy waters and confusing trails, a kayak always found the safest and fastest way. She never got lost. Day three, a kayak and Squinty, Big Boy and Flinty, Roscoe and the rest of the team pounded across the snow for three days. The dogs were ready to break out, but Mick held them back. There was a right time, but not yet. High in the Alaskan range, they caught up to Willie Ketchum in third place. It was his team that had beaten them by just one minute last year. Following the rules, Willie pulled over and allowed Mick's team to pass. That old dog will never make it. He laughed at a kayak across the biting wind. She'll be waiting for you at Nome, Mick vowed. Day four. High in the Kuskokwim Mountains, they passed tall Tim Brunsey's team and moved into second place. Just after Tokotna, Mick's team made its move. They raced by Whistlin Perry's team to take over first place. Ketchum made his move too. His team clung to Mix like a shadow. A kayak and her team now had to break trail through deep snow. It was tough going. By the Ophir checkpoint, a kayak was limping. The deep snow had jammed up one of her paw pads and made it sore. Mick tended to her as Ketchum raced by and took first place from them. You can't run on that, on that paw, old girl, Mick said to her. With a day's rest, it'll heal, but the team can't wait here a day. We've got to go on without you. You'll be flown home. Roscoe took a kayak's place at lead. Day five. By morning, most of the other dog teams had passed through the Ophir checkpoint. The wind was building and the pilot was in a hurry to leave. A kayak tore at the leash as the volunteer brought her to the airplane. Get that dog in, the pilot hollered. I want to get out of here before the storm hits. A kayak jumped and pulled and snapped. All she wanted was to get back on the trail, to run, to win. Then all at once, the wind gusted, the plane shifted, and a kayak twisted out of the handler's grip. By the time they turned around, she was gone. Day six. A kayak ran while the storm became a blizzard. She knew that Mick and the team were somewhere ahead of her. The wind took away the scent and the snow took away the trail, but still she knew the way. 
She ran and she ran until the blizzard became a whiteout. Then she could run no more. While Mick and the team took refuge in Galena seven hours ahead, a kayak burrowed into a snowdrift to wait out the storm. In the morning, the mound of snow came alive and out pushed a kayak. Day seven, word had gone out that a kayak was loose. Trail volunteers knew that an experienced lead dog would stick to the trail. They knew she'd have to come through Unalaklit. She did. Six hours after Mick and the team had left, a kayak padded softly, cautiously into the checkpoint. Her ears alert, her wet nose sniffed the air. The team had been there, she could tell. Suddenly, cabin doors flew open. Five volunteers fanned out and tried to grab her. A kayak zigged around their every zag and took off down the trail. Call ahead to Shaktulik, a man shouted. Day eight. At Shaktulik, Mick dropped two more dogs and raced out, still six hours ahead of a kayak. Hungry now, it had been two days since she had eaten. A kayak pounded over the packed trail. For thirst, she drank out of the streams and ice broken through by the sled, the ice broken through by the sled teams. She struggled into Shaktulik in the late afternoon. Three men spotted her and chased her right into the community hall where some mushers were sleeping. Tables overturned and coffee went flying. And then one musher opened the back door and she escaped. Go find him, girl, he whispered. At Koyuk, a kayak raided the musher's discard pile for food. No one came after her. At Elam, people put food out for her. Almost everybody was rooting for a kayak to catch her team. Day nine, Mick rushed into the white into White Mountain, 22 minutes behind Ketchum. Here, the teams had to take an eight hour layover to rest before the final dash for Nome. Mick dropped Big Boy and put Young Comet in his place. The team was down to eight dogs with 77 miles to go. A kayak pushed on. When her team left White Mountain at 6 p.m., a kayak was running through Golovin just two hours behind. A crowd lined the trail to watch her run through the town. Day 10. Screaming winds threw bitter cold at the teams as they fought their way along the coast. Then, halfway to the checkpoint called Safety, they came upon a maze of snowmobile tracks. The lead dogs lost their trail, lost the trail. Mick squinted through the snow, looking for a sign. There, going right, she recognized Ketchum's trail. Gee, she called. Gee, go right. But the dogs wouldn't go. They wandered about, tangling up the lines. Mick straightened them out and worked the team up the hill. At the top, they stopped short. Something was blocking the trail. A kayak, Mick called. She ran to her usual spot at the harness, waiting to be hooked in. Sorry, old girl, Mick hugged her. The rules say I can't put you back in a harness. Get in the sled. But instead, a kayak circled the lead dogs, pushing them and barking. What is it, girl? Mick asked. A kayak ran back down the hill. Mick laughed. Ketchum's team had taken the wrong trail. She turned her team around and rushed them down to a kayak, who jumped into the sled. Take us to Nome, Mick called to her. Mick first heard the noise a mile outside of Nome. At first, she wasn't sure what it was. It grew so loud that she couldn't hear the dogs. It was a roar or a rumble. She was so tired after 10 days of mushing, she couldn't tell which. Then she saw the crowd and heard their cheers. People had come from everywhere to see the courageous dog that had run the Iditarod Trail alone. As sure as if she had seen as sure as she had been in the lead position, a kayak won the Iditarod race. Nothing was going to stop this dog from winning, Mick told the crowd. A kayak knew it. The other dogs knew it too. This is just an author's note that says, the Iditarod race above all, the Iditarod race is above all a race of the heart for both human beings and dogs. As with any race, however, the Iditarod has rules to ensure fairness and safety for the mushers and dogs. A musher must stop and sign in at each checkpoint on the trail. In addition, a musher must take a 24-hour stop at some point during the race, one eight-hour stop on the Yukon, and one eight-hour stop at White Mountain. 
the maximum number of dogs a musher can start with is 16, and a musher must finish the race with at least five. When one team gets within 50 feet of another, the team behind has the immediate right of way upon demand. The musher ahead must stop his dogs for at least one minute or allow the other team to pass. An injured, sick, or fatigued dog may be dropped at a designated dog drop and flown back to Anchorage to be picked up and taken home. A dropped dog may not be put back in harness and may not run next to the team. However, a loose dog found on the trail may be put in the sled and taken to the next checkpoint. I would like to acknowledge the hard work and competence of the Iditarod Trail volunteers from Robert J. Blake.